Hello everyone, how are you doing this wonderful Friday evening? I hope everyone's all right and actually tuned into this because I know it's been a long week and we're probably all exhausted from Christmas and wrapping up the year end, etc. I wanted to do this session because January is going to be a big time for many people. People are going to be reflecting on where they're going with their careers. It's the end of a financial year for some and for many people and an end of a bonus year. So I know it's a time when people will be thinking about making pivots and shifts. And I thought it would be a good time to have a talk about how to make those pivots and shifts and how to make them work for you. And what I'd like to say is that this session is going to be about staying in a career, staying in a typical sort of um, employed career. But I know that many people also want to start businesses or to take on freelancing. So I will have a bit to say about that as I go through. Um, but the focus is really going to be on how you approach a career transition if you want to move within the same company or you want to move to another company. So I do have a slide deck, but I want to touch on a couple of things before I get into the slide deck of my nine step career transition scan. And the, the main thing that I want to touch on is this topic of HR. So I have been making a few waves on LinkedIn, speaking my truth and speaking about my thoughts on the recruitment process in general. And I've been an entrepreneur now for, for roughly three years. And very recently, I had this experience where a friend of mine who works at a quite prominent company invited me to share my CV with him uh, because he thought that I could come and make a difference at this company. And I thought about this process and then I thought, OK, I am my CV is not in a position to share with any company because my CV is not designed for traditional work. My CV is designed like an entrepreneur's CV. It's basically about things, projects that I've done. It's all designed around the projects that I've done. And therefore I need to rework it to fit into the classic CV of a traditional company. So I hired someone to have a look at my CV. And one of the things about my CV, as if you ever have seen my CV or looked at my LinkedIn profile, is that I've done an incredible number of jobs. So I started in finance. I have a finance and accounting degree. I moved into internal audit. Then I moved into supply chain. I did a lot of big projects in supply chain. And then I moved into entrepreneurship and innovation, sustainability, coaching, business development. So there's a whole heap of things that I have learned how to do that don't fit in a traditional work context. So I struggle to think about my CV in a traditional work context. And I thought to myself, why not ask someone to help me redesign my CV? And someone had a look at my CV and they spent a couple of weeks looking at my CV. And then they basically said that they couldn't address my CV, which was, which was an incredible experience to have, but also an important one, an important one to reflect on what is the role of HR in recruiting talent? So is this person telling me that my talent isn't right for the types of organizations that I could potentially work for? I don't think that that's the point, right? And that's not the point that HR wants to create when they create these, these rules and guides and and hacks about how to have a CV that passes an ATS tracker, or how to have a CV that is easy to scan in seven seconds. The reality is HR focuses on efficiency and not effectiveness in the talent process. And this is a problem, I think, for a lot of companies and something that I think businesses need to address and need to seriously think about as they go through the war for talent that's coming in the few years and actually is on at this moment. So. What I want you to reflect on is HR is looking for something specific. Unfortunately, at the moment, we cannot change that. We can influence it within the companies that we work in. And the more senior you are, the more you're likely to be able to influence this. So please do. But for the moment, if you're looking for a transition, you need to hit all the boxes that HR asks for. Um, and as sad as that is, it means really focusing in on the specific job that you want. And that means doing a lot of soul searching beforehand. It means really getting into what it is that will really make you happy, um, as well as what's available on the market. So you need to think about these things before you start approaching that job market. And so I share that story just to, to bring that conversation to the table. And I think as leaders, we need to own the talent process 
And if HR is not serving your needs, you need to challenge HR. You need to challenge HR to do better, right? Searching a CV or scanning a CV in seven seconds only leads to bias in recruitment. So if you understand that, you would actually change your HR process, I'm sure. So anyway, that's my pet peeve of the day. So what I'm gonna do is attempt now to share my presentation. So hopefully you can see that. And I'm gonna talk you through my nine step career transition scan. Hopefully it's big enough for you to see the ideas that I bring up. So the first idea that I wanna to introduce to you is this quote, which is happen to your career and don't let it happen to you. And I think as we move on in age, as we, as we mature and as we build experience, sometimes we are less proactive when it comes to shaping what's next in our career. When we're younger, we're more willing to take risks. We're more willing to challenge the status quo, perhaps. But when we get older, we're looking toward retirement. We're looking toward, you know, finishing that mortgage, getting the kids into university, et cetera. And somehow we kind of lose focus on the career. The thing is, we're still spending roughly half of our waking hours at work, possibly more, right, depending on who you are. Um, so I think it's important for us to to kind of own this process and to really understand what it is is giving us the benefit and the joy from the work that we do or enough challenge, right? Because work isn't just about joy or life isn't just about joy, right? It's, it's a little bit about challenge. It's about solving problems. And what are the problems you really want to solve? and therefore focusing in on those problems. So let's get into this a bit more. So just a brief about me, if you don't know me, like I think most of the people on LinkedIn have seen me a lot and probably know a bit about me, but I have 20 years of work experience, 10 years in accounting, three years, sorry, five years in internal audit, three years in supply chain, in logistics specifically, four years in supply chain planning. Then I've been an expat in three different cultures. I have um, certain degrees and qualifications that too much to mention. And I've spent the last three years as an entrepreneur. And those things, all of those things for me, make me vial valuable, valuable and viable talent for any organization. But I can't necessarily succinctly state those things in a CV. But it's a good thing I'm not looking for a job. So in, in terms of taking on career transitions, let's get into the idea that I have. And I'm probably going to try to make this a little bit bigger so that you can see these ideas a little bit more. So the first thing to do when you're going through a career transition is to map out where you are and thinking about reflecting on where you are as a person and, a, and an individual in your life, um, where you are as a family, as a as a national, as, as anything that's relevant to how you identify yourself and really mapping out that situation, understanding the experiences you've accumulated so far and what they contribute to your life in the next phase, right? And this is an important part of the process. And this is actually the part of the process when I do my career transition courses that I spend the most time. And it's, it's the part of the process that takes people probably two months to fully to fully flesh out if they want to do it in the best way. And it's not that you have to do this on every job transition. I mean, I know people are doing job transition transitions now without ever looking at this in any depth. But if you take the time to do this well, the next thing that you do will be so much better for it. And that's the importance here, like taking that time out to really assess things and to really align things with where the direction of your life wants to go, where you want to take yourself, where you want to own your next experience, if you take the time on this process, you will be more than successful. I'm, I am certain of it. So the next step in this is the succession planning. So after you've done this for, for a few weeks and mapping out where you are, it's time to think about the succession planning. And this is one of the reasons I talk about this nine step process as being something that fits in any part of the journey that you're in. So if you've just changed jobs, it's relevant. If you're about to change jobs, it's relevant. If you are in the middle of assessing whether you're gonna change jobs next year or in the middle of the year or whatever, it is relevant. But the point is that you have to stage this thing. You have to plan this if you want to grow in the traditional world of employment. I will come to entrepreneurship in a bit, but let's talk about traditional employment first of all. So the next bit of that is understanding your next role. 
So doing the next role transition planning, looking at exactly where the roles that would suit you best uh, are located in which companies or in the existing company that you're in, who's in them, et cetera. Then the next one is your job strategy execution. And this is a little bit of understanding about the role itself, understanding about what you bring to that role, understanding what um, other people can help you with in that role as well. Then number five of this process is the digital brand building. And this is most relevant when you're moving into an external company, but it is also relevant internally depending on the size of your company. So if you have a really a really big organization that is multinational, for example, having a strong digital brand is also good for building that reputation across that company because um, LinkedIn is a, is a source of traffic for a lot of big brands. So it's an important place for you to establish your authority in the area that you are the authority on. So that's an important phase. Then there is systems. So step six is about your systems. And step six assumes that you've now gotten, to, gotten the job already. So there's a piece in the middle there that I haven't even spoken about, but it's kind of covered in the job strategy and execution. But it is around the actual putting your CV out there, getting that feedback, iterating, tailoring that CV to the job, et cetera. But this is not about CV writing. I'm, I'm not an HR person and I will not profess to be the expert at CV writing because I think CV writing is really an HR. Uh, it's, it's only a desirable skill for HR people. It's not a desirable skill for me. But um, moving on to that, once you've gotten that position of having the job, you then need to build really strong systems or migrate your strong systems from your previous job into this new role. And the way you think about and approach those systems is going to be important for you. Then there's the onboarding. And, and the onboarding is really about testing your systems. It is about understanding what is going to work in this environment and what isn't going to work in this environment. And that's why it's really crucial to starting new roles. Then you have your sort of review, and that is to update, to go through a process of, of training and maybe technical training as well as your own personal skills training to address the needs of the specific role once you know more about it. And then finally is the stage of making a pitch where you actually pitch an idea to uh, who, whomever, it would be your, your new line manager or whomever. So these are the nine steps in, in my career transition scanning system. And you know some, some key points for you to note as we go through this process, right? So knowing your mission and your goals, is key to mapping out where you are. Making an assessment of your key experiences and, and interest is also important. And knowing the key outcomes you want to achieve is, is also essential. Design thinking for your career. So what is your career meant to do for you? What are you expecting to achieve? And what's the best path to that outcome? So this is something that you really need to think about. And this is where I'm going to start potentially talking about whether you want to go into the same traditional type of employment that you're in today, or if you want to look at becoming a freelancer or an entrepreneur or a consultant, et cetera. So let's tap into this a little bit more. And I have a few, I'm going to shrink this again so that, so that I can, you can see me and we can talk about this. So careers, career ideas and choices, and I'm, I'm making fun of, of one, the, the top one, but actually, I don't think any of these are invalid choices. I think they're all very valid choices. So when I talk about the Sleepy Hollow, I actually just mean someone who wants to just have money for the purpose of their life. So they're not necessarily in the job because that job gives them anything. They're in that job because that job gives them uh, income in order to, to finance what they really care about. So, and that's a very valid choice. Um, there are various stages in your life where that can be the right choice for you, right? It could possibly be the right choice for you throughout your life, right? But you need to, to decide that. The next is the impact maker. So someone who is really out there to, to go and make impact. They're not necessarily interested in an income for their work. They're more interested in purpose. So this could be people who get into potentially clergy work or even in terms of, you know, supporting aid, um, helping uh, 
impoverished communities, things like this, people who really want to make impact in the world. <laughs> I would argue that people who are into sustainability um, often fit a little bit into this category as well. Then you have the lifestyle influencer. And when I talk about a lifestyle influencer, I mean someone who is doing a job that is about the life that they want to enjoy. So to give some examples, you can be a ski instructor. So maybe someone really likes skiing. They've developed certain skills in skiing and therefore they become ski instructors so they can stay continuously in the ski slopes at the times when the ski slopes are open, right? That's a lifestyle influencer of sorts, right? So this is someone who really knows deeply about this thing that they're in. Um, and if you want to do, you know, it could be it could be someone who's a guitarist, a singer, songwriter, things like this. A corporate jet setter. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about this one in a moment, right? A corporate jet setter is basically someone who is really trying to climb the ranks of this corporate world and space that, that we have come to sort of appreciate as a sort of mecca in your, in your career journey if you are um, very educated. So if you've gone through a long education system, there is a likelihood that corporate jet setting is on your agenda. Uh, a serial entrepreneur is someone who really likes to start things. And this is a key characteristic, right? You've, you've been through those HR personality and behavioral tests that talks about completer finishers versus the ones who are starters and idea creators, right? The serial entrepreneur is, is a starter, someone who will get good projects off the ground. And if you think about it, organizations need all of these things to, to survive and thrive. Um, but the serial entrepreneur is really that, that spark, that person who ignites things. And then the corporation builder is someone who comes in and is the completer finisher, right? So someone who is going to take this big idea to its next stage and to its natural conclusion. They will bring this idea to life. So there are great examples of these people, right? So I'm just going to quickly check to see if my next slide covers it. No, it doesn't. So I'm going to talk about the examples. Um, and I would call Bill Gates a kind of corporation builder. I mean, I know he was the guy who initiated the ideas as well in Microsoft, but I think that he his, his personality fits the corporation builder. The serial entrepreneur is more like Elon Musk, right? So he's someone who's really starting new things. And, and the interesting thing about some of these um, characters that I'm calling is that they're all neurodiverse, which is a whole other conversation. Um, the corporate jet setter. So there's a guy by the name of, well, actually, I won't say his name. Does anyone know who's the head of design or who has been the head of design at Apple for all of their influential product launches, right? If you know the answer to that, I'd be really impressed. But that guy is somebody I would describe as a corporate jet setter. So someone who built a corporate career, got to, got to the point of really owning that corporate career um, before he, he decided to, to leave Apple and sit on many boards. His name is Johnny Ives, right? But he's not the kind of name that somebody's going to recognize unless they're in design, right? If you're in design, you know this guy. If you're not in design, you've probably never heard of him. You've only heard of Steve Jobs. So that's an interesting perspective on the corporate jet setters. Like it, it's not someone who achieves necessarily worldwide global notoriety, except in their discipline, in their in their really core functional area. So I think that's really an interesting um, idea to kind of get your head around as well. So there are also like three modalities to to sort of owning a job in the corporate jet set space, right? And I wanna get into that a little bit because I know most of the people that, that are probably listening here are in a corporate role. And if you wanna ask questions, please do, right? So please feel free to comment and I will try to answer them. I'm not necessarily seeing comments from Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, um, I'm sorry if I don't see your comments, but if you are on LinkedIn, I will see your comments. So the three modalities are the specialists, this portfolio of skills and the portfolio of experiences. So let's talk about these a little bit more so that you get a bit of understanding of what I mean by this. A specialist has a deep domain specialization and is at the cutting edge of design and creation in this space. So this is someone who will really go to the end degree. They will need to call the absolute experts on something in order to get answers because no one in their organization will be able to answer them. They are so specialized. They are so deep into this topic that they are really the owner of that topic in the organization. And they will influence the future design of that specialist area in the wider world possibly, 
right? Because they are so specialists in this in this topic. They are likely to um, be able to have to be authors of their own work. They probably have a dissertation from their university degree as well. They probably go on to do PhDs if there's something that they're interested in, but they're definitely authorities in this space. And they collaborate with others to improve the design of that thing, to improve the working and functionality of that thing that they are the specialists at. Then you have the person who is that portfolio of skills. So I'm going to change the screen again so that you can see this one clearer. So this one is good at one domain, but has exposure to many domains. Skilled at problem solving, so skilled at managing and coordinating change as well and capable of asking relevant questions based on their interdisciplinary knowledge. So when I worked in corporate in the corporate world, I was pretty much a portfolio of skills. I had enough skills that I could ask the right questions in several different settings in order to make projects better. So I was good at risk management. I was good at controls. I was good at continuous improvement because I had this understanding of how things work from the portfolio of things that happen in a business. Right. And, and people, people in this sort of category, they tend to become managers of people in business units, managers of change. Um, they tend to say to stay um, in they don't like specialist roles is, is another thing. And they tend to stay in the same industry for most of their lives. And the reason for staying in the same industry or the reason I would even guide that they stay in the same industry is because when you're building this portfolio of many different skills, it's quite difficult to become deep enough in any to be relevant outside of your industry. So if you really want to, to build this portfolio of, and variety, I would recommend that you absolutely try to stay close to the industry that you have built your formative skills in. And this will help you to get those promotions, to, to leave one job for the next, but be promoted when you make that transition because you have enough of this industry knowledge and the breadth in order to be able to convince people that you're going to be a perfect hire. If you're going to take your portfolio of skills and move to a completely different industry, you're going to find that you, you have lost a lot of your footing in terms of the breadth of things that you understand because that new environment will be so different. So you need to think about that. It doesn't have to be the exact same industry, but it has to be a related industry in order for this to make sense. So I'd love you to reflect on that a bit. So let's look at the next bit. And this is experiences. So this is pretty much uh, people who have um, sort of the skill of culture, let's call it this, and of organizational design and of bringing, bringing different elements together. This person is deep on empathy. They're great at vision and they're great at bringing ideas from different places. So this person is probably the closest an organization gets to having the entrepreneurial mindset, right? They, they are really good at drawing on their experiences to bring innovation to, to a team and to a design and to a future. So depending on how you fit in these three paradigms, um, you can start shaping what your career will be next, right? I think if you're, if you're pretty much a specialist type, Specialists do well in freelancing and also in centers of excellence. So if if you want to get into freelancing and, and you feel like this is a, a niche for you, you really need to have those connections beyond your current workplace, beyond you know the, the periphery of, of what, what's known in order to get into the spaces where your freelancing skills will be not only needed, but recognized and well paid for. Right. Otherwise, it's a bit harder. If you have a portfolio of skills and you want to get into freelancing, it's going to be a little bit harder for you. So if you're the portfolio of skills person, I would recommend looking to startups. So looking at places where people are um, where you need to have a breadth of skills and you need to know how things work, have that experience and can bring value. So startups are a good place for, for those people. And in terms of the experience, the experiences people, you want to look at leading organizations. You want to look at leading those startups, perhaps, or even um, looking at uh, new ventures and existing organizations, et cetera. So these are ways that you can start thinking about your career decision based on several parameters. And of course, you know, we can talk all about this. If you have any questions, I am here for it. Please feel free to ask me any questions that you want. 
So that's sort of the, the framework. What I wanted to touch on is if you're a mature job seeker and you're considering starting a business, um, I would say look for the opportunities before you leave your job. So um, unless you have a huge cushion, if you have a huge cushion to fall back on, let's say two years, <laughs> if you have two years of a cushion, then definitely you can leave now and give yourself the time to think about what you really want to do. Um, but it takes time to build a a consulting or freelance uh, business and career um, if you want to make that kind of shift. So you want to make sure that you have enough backing to do that or you have an immediate job. Um, and I'm telling you this from experience. <laughs> I have done it and I have managed to succeed at it, but it has taken some time. So the other thing I'd like you to reflect on is um, doing side gigs, right? So if, if it's an area that you want to explore, possibly consider taking on a small side gig to give yourself a feel for what it could be like, the area that you want to get into. If you completely want to shift your skills, then you definitely want to make sure that you have somewhere that will help you mold that new transition and skill before you go out on your own. Okay, so then the other thing I would say is to look for strategic alliances. So if, you, if you're thinking about moving out on your own, look for people who have a complementary skill set where you both can go to the market together with that skill set and sort of uh, negotiate to, to bring that to life. Um, because the marketing is the most difficult part of going off on your own, especially because there are so many people who go off on their own. And you can imagine, I mean, you you experienced today the noise of how many people are out in their own pitching for their businesses, right? So this is an important thing for you to, to think through. Um, and then you want to leverage your knowledge across the startup landscape, because I think that's the place where your experience, if you're a mid-career person, your experience would be most beneficial. The next one is new graduate. So if you are a new graduate and, and following on with me today, Look for graduate training programs and consider the planet. Get involved with green tech and sustainable startups as early as possible, because as they grow in scale, they will become the next big thing. So this, the next few slides, I'm going to skip through very quickly because we've sort of talked about this already. And I, I really want to get to a place where you can ask me a few questions. So the thing about successes is to identify more than one and craft ways to set challenges for these people as you plan your own transition. So get those successes activated before you even think about moving. The next one is your next role planning. So this is you deciding on what you're gonna do next. So choose the internal roles. So if, it, if you're planning to stay in the company that you're in, choose the internal roles, assess them with new information. So assess them as in, look at how you would do that role in a different way. Get a strategy in place, so get a good, strong foundation strategy in place as to how you're going to approach that role. And then think rule of three, three things that you would want to make a difference in. Um, if it's external, you want to assess the criteria for the type of company you want to work in. You want to choose those external companies, and then you want to get more data, more data as possible to make that firm decision. Then we get into the point of headhunters. So headhunters and how they work it's really something that I think people need to understand. So they are contracted by companies. They usually have non-compete clauses and will not poach from another company that they work with. So in one industry, you may need to work with several headhunters in order to get to the companies that you want to get to, unless you're very specific about that one company. And then you just need to know that one headhunter that works for that company. Um, they go first by referral. So they, they generally ask their existing network uh, for recommendations of people. Um, then they, they check on LinkedIn and, and then through their offline networks. In fact, I think the offline networks are before LinkedIn. So the bottom line is that headhunter relationships are a networking game. So you need to leverage your network. This is, this is one of the many reasons you need to leverage your network, besides the fact that your direct network can get you into jobs as well without the headhunter. So then let's talk about networks and how to build them. So the first bit is to, if you know where you want to go, that's that's important before you get to the stage, then you need to map your sort of first and second level connections that are linked to where you want to go. And then you want to have a really clear strategy about how to approach that network. That's essential. 
Then we have the digital brand building, and this is a big area, right? This is another area that we go deeply in into my course. But what is your brand? And my opinion and theory of what your brand is, is the sum of your behaviors, the values and beliefs, the identity and the mission as illustrated by the kind of environments that you create. So your brand is something tangible in terms of the, the um, emotion that surrounds you in your environment. So it's kind of the sum of the achievements to date, the people you have impacted and who attribute some part of their own brand building to you, right? So think about your brand in these sort of ways. Step six is about personal and business systems. So this is yours and others. And what I mean by this is what makes you effective? So what makes you good at what you do today? Um, what are the sort of characteristics inside your playbook today? And what are the characteristics of your competition? Right. So this is kind of looking um, at a holistic way at what systems are driving the marketplace and driving you. Then inside the company, you want to look at data sources, you want to look at processes, and you want to look at how these things integrate in order to make an impact. And understanding how that's going to work in the future for you, if you go to this role within the company or outside of the company, is going to be essential to your success when you land on the job. Step seven is the onboarding. And onboarding is fundamentally about three things. It's about understanding your stakeholders and knowing how to navigate those stakeholders. The second is about understanding the key projects that are happening in this organization, not just your key projects, but the key projects of this organization and how that organization is going to bring about change and impact and profit and all of the important things that that organization is focused on. And then the other is risk, revenue and costs, right? So understanding how that is all being generated. So getting clear on these things, you know, I know people look at this and say, oh my God, that's so obvious. No, it's not so obvious because People think that on onboarding is about technical skills and onboarding is very little about the technical skills. Onboarding is about understanding what's important in that organization and how these levers are being used to leverage power, um, uh, income, uh, budgeting, et cetera, in the organization. So it's important for you to, to get under the skin of that very early on so that you don't have slip ups, right? So then step eight is about review and update. So this is about assessing your playbook, looking at that playbook again, looking at the things that you need to tweak and change for the organization or the particular function or new job that you're in. And then it is about really fundamentally asking the critical questions. And the critical questions can only come if you really understand what this business is about. And that's why it's so important to use your onboarding for getting a great feeling for what this organization is really trying to make happen. And then finally, it's about making a pitch. And this is one of the, I think, the underestimated bits about taking on new jobs. And I've seen it happen time and time again. People show up in a new role, they spend their first 90 days, and then they're too shy to ask for what they need. The problem is, if you don't ask for what you need in the first 90 days, you will not have what you need. It is that simple. If you don't ask for it, you won't get it. So you need to think critically about what it's going to take to be successful in this role in that first 90 days on the job. And then you need to be able to ask for it. And you need to know how to make that pitch so that you get supported with the budget that you need. And that's why the conversations and the onboarding process is so important and how you level yourself up in that job is so important, how understanding the processes and systems are important because you cannot make a successful pitch if you don't have clarity on those things. So I hope that this nine step process was very, very clear. The keys in this, of course, the keys in your pitch is gonna be about needing investments and being prepared. And the kind of things that I wanna close with now is that you need to know on a deep intuitive level what you really want. Right. And you need to be able to step into that, into your new role. You need to be clear, crystal clear on what that is. And I know that this is something that that people are still trying to figure out. And that's why I spend so much time on it in my career transition work. Right. So that's the first month. Basically, we're just spending time on this. The next one is to be strategic in your approach. And this is about the frame of mind that you approach your challenges with. 
And it's how you how you get into that frame of mind, how you um, sort of uh, work with yourself intentionally to get into the frame of mind that you are clear on how you're going to make an impact. The final two are about doing the work, right? So I, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of thought that there should be work-life balance, et cetera. And, and definitely, I believe that there needs to be a mix of, of sort of experiences in your work and life. But I don't think we could ideally completely separate them. If you are separating your work and life so much, you're probably living a lie in some one of those places. So I would challenge yourself on that. You know, maybe maybe it's not the same for you, but I would ask yourself the question at least to see if there's any truth in that. Because I think that we, if we are doing work that aligns with our life, then we feel a lot more natural joy coming from the job, a lot more intrinsic value from the work that we do. And therefore, you don't need reward centers when you go home. You know, you don't need to have these externalized forces of reward. So it's something that I think is worth thinking about as the world shifts to the sustainability space, because it's important for us to understand where we're going to take the world. The other one is to have a clear outcome in mind with sort of metrics and, and an understanding of where you are on your timeline to achieving what you want. OK, so I hope that was clear. If you have any questions, I haven't seen any comments. I do look forward to your comments. If you want to inbox me, feel free to inbox me. But I'd love to know your thoughts and your reflections. Um, I will tell you a little bit about how to work with me. So my group coaching program is now open. It is a membership that starts on the 9th of January and it goes on for six months. Um, inside that membership, we're going to be talking about all of these nine steps in detail with a lot of special guests and a lot of bits and pieces that you're going to need. So salary negotiations, um, looking at how to, to get through those interviews, but also how to leverage who you are in any space that you're in. And we go through those nine steps. We will go through the specialists and get some insights. Definitely, you will have the opportunity to share with me your journey. There will be one-to-ones involved in this as well, so that I get to help you more directly as we go through the process. I, I stagger the one-to-ones at the beginning, at the middle, and toward the end, or definitely before your, your interviews. Um, typically, the feedback and, and sort of performance of this program in the last run that I've had is that Everyone who has taken it to the end has seen a promotion or a um, job grade improvement or a huge shift in confidence. So, and they're still working on the negotiation piece, right? So it's been hugely successful because it takes, it allows you to take that time and space to figure out what you want. And so if you want to get in on that, you can actually go. So if you don't want to type this in from, from what you're seeing on the screen, if you go to my link tree, either in my Facebook profile or on my profile on LinkedIn, you will understand how to get involved with this program. So thank you very much for listening. I have enjoyed sharing this with you. And please feel free to drop me a message if you want to um, ask me any questions and find out more about the program. And if you need any further guidance on the next steps that you need to take. Thanks for joining me and have a lovely weekend. See you soon. Bye.